Stoicism has maintained a name as the preeminent philosophy of the internet for the last few years. In my experience, it's difficult not to run into the growing Stoic conversation online. People like Ryan Holiday have made a living off this ancient philosophy. It's an understatement that I think that it is strange that an over 2,000 year old philosophy would suddenly re-emerge into the cultural consciousness. One just has to look at Ryan Holiday's conversation partners to see the movement in our midst. People like Rick Rubin, Camille Cabello, and Matthew McConaughey. These are not who you would necessarily associate with the Stoic movement. I imagine people like famous weightlifters and hyper-masculine figures. But here we see something different. Holiday is talking to artists and cultural influencers of both film and music. This is also interesting considering how countercultural the main message of Stoicism is. It calls everyone to radical self-discipline. The Stoic's goal is to build their own character, and most sources of pleasure distract from this goal. To indulge one's senses is to weaken the will when temptation to compromise comes. Compared to our American culture of do what you want as long as it doesn't hurt anyone else, the difference is night and day. The day is November 11th, 2011, and a video game that would change history is released. The fifth entry in the Elder Scrolls franchise, Skyrim. While the first few games were released for MS-DOS, the third entry in the franchise, Morrowind, was the first to launch the series to a much wider audience due to it being released on both Windows and Xbox. Due to the success of this entry, we saw the release of Oblivion in 2006, and five years later we come to that fateful day that brought so many eyes to this franchise. Directed by the ever-controversial Todd Howard, Skyrim was an experience like none other on the market. An open world with many corners to discover, complex quest lines to explore, and engaging ways to build a character to fit the way that you want to play. Compared to other games that came out that year, Skyrim was the least linear by far. No storyline had to be followed, and almost any path was open to you after you finished the introduction. While some of my favorite games came out that same year, like Portal 2 and The Witcher 2, I can understand why Skyrim swept almost every consideration for Game of the Year in 2011. The year is 300 BC, and a young man who would go on to belong to in Zeno of Sidium meets with the Oracle to discover his fate. He asks the Oracle, how do I go about living the best life? And the Oracle responds by telling him he should take on the complexion of the dead. Zeno interprets this as a call to study the writings of the now dead philosophers. After some time, as a merchant, he became quite wealthy where he ceased his trade and became a student of the Cynic School of Philosophy, and later the Platonic School. When he started his own, own, his students were given the name Stoic, the same name as the poets who were known to gather around the same parts of the city. Zeno's vision of God was not entirely like his contemporaries. In a sense, he saw the entire universe as one being ordered by some sort of divine wisdom and reason, which he referred to simply as the Logos which is a Greek word that can mean both, literally, word and reason. Zeno saw that humanity had a special capacity to both act in accordance with the Logos and do great things such as create systems of justice and make great cities, but he also saw that humanity had another special capacity to act against this divine reason. Humanity could give in to their desires and just take whatever they wanted. Humanity could become lower than even animals. Zeno taught how to align oneself with the Logos and cultivate virtue in a way that one would never find themselves in conflict with the divine order of the universe. Often, this meant not trying to climb ladders of hierarchy out of ambition, but identifying your place in the world and to do it well without complaining. It didn't matter if you fell into royalty or were a slave, you were to do as what the Logos called you to do. This was a life well lived, and if done directly, a life well died. Zeno died in his 70s, and this is how Laertius describes his death. As he was leaving the school, he tripped and fell, breaking his toe. Striking the ground with his fist, he quoted the line from Niope, I come, I come, why dost thou call for me? And died on the spot through holding his breath. He did not leave before his indelible mark was left on the world, and would go on to make waves in the world of politics and philosophy. The day is December 21st, 2014, 
at my cousin's house in North Carolina on my Acer laptop looking for games to find during the Steam winter sale. I'd just begun to delve into the world of PC games and had a spout of independence in my ability to choose what I could play. And buy for that matter. People have been recommending that I play Skyrim for the last three years due to my interest in games like Legend of Zelda, but I just tucked that in the back of my head um, and just kept playing Majora's Mask. However, I had $50 burning a hole in my Steam wallet, and this game looked amazing. I easily paid the $14.77 for the game and all the DLC and began to download my first Bethesda game, something that would change my life. I can still see the clean new carpet I was sitting on and the old wired Xbox controller that I was using. And I can still feel my stomach drop when I saw a Stormcloak's head fall from his shoulders. We wake up on a carriage, and it doesn't take us long to realize what's at stake. Sitting between a horse thief and the leader of the Stormcloak Rebellion, we realize our life is on the line. As a Stoic, the consideration of our inevitable death is not new to us. We've prepared for this day our entire adult lives. Every morning and evening, we've spent at least some time in meditation to ready ourselves for death. May we face our execution with honor and die on our terms, not as a victim of the system, but in submission to the kingdom of our home. The name of our character is Marcus, after the famous Stoic Emperor of Rome. In the wrong place, at the wrong time, we were grabbed along with a group of rebels who sought to challenge the sovereignty of the Empire. We tried to inform the Imperial soldiers of our situation, but to no avail. In the end, our death seems like a small price to pay for the possibility of peace from a dissolution of the Stormcloak leadership. For a moment, it seems like Hadvar recognizes us, but he knows as well as we do that our fate is sealed. Sealed. Lokir, the cowardly horse thief that joined us on our way to Hulligan, makes a run for it, and we cringe at the sight. To die such a cowardly death is a shame. It's a rebellion against the world's proper order. We don't know what we expected, but we hoped for more courage. This scene is contrasted by a noble rebel soldier who meets his death head on. That will be a tough act to follow. We are called next and remind ourselves that the Logos of the world is in total control. All we must do is surrender ourselves to it. The year is 68 AD, and we see a slave in his 20s by the name of Epictetus. Despite his low social status, Epictetus found himself in the company of figures of great importance. One of his slave masters was secretary to Nero. Despite his lowly social standing, he voraciously learned philosophy with the permission of his master. This does not mean he was entirely well treated. One of his masters is said to have broken his legs to a point that he walked with a crutch for the rest of his life. However, Nero's death has brought an unexpected twist to Epictetus' story. He finds himself free. He will teach philosophy at Rome for a number of years before he's exiled from Rome with all the other philosophers. He will finally find himself in Greece, where he established a school and produces some of the most influential Stoic texts the world has ever seen. Of the topics he addresses, death, of course, is among them. Why would one fear death? This is a question that challenged the most common human instinct that is repeated by generations of Stoics. I was dead once, before I entered my mother's womb. So why would I be afraid to return? Death is the fate of all humanity. If one is afraid of death, they need to take every opportunity to get over this limitation, because one never knows when death will come for oneself. The practice within Stoicism that is meant to address this very real need is called momenta mori. Translated, the Latin phrase means, remember that you die. In execution, the practitioner takes time to habitually consider one's mortality and how he will act when the time comes for him. The practitioner may also have a symbol that reminds him of this fact daily, either on his person or in a workspace, such as an hourglass or a skull. Though the Stoics latched closely to this practice, so did other traditions. Christianity and Buddhism are just two others that practice a version of momentum mori. 
as a preparation for the fate that all men face. The year is 2017, and I'm in my last year of high school. I had enough of the cultural nihilism that covered my education and life, and found a class that seemed to offer an opportunity out of this malaise. The course entitled Humanities took up a major portion of our schedules as high school seniors. In order to be in the class, I had to give up on several other electives, including film studies and another course called Sci-Fi Horror Fantasy. Humanities, however, was worth every sacrifice I made in order to take it. Taught in two sections, one teacher, Ms. Eigen, taught the literature portion, and another, Ms. Zonoff, taught the history portion. While the two would some days keep us separate and switch the two classes between periods, most days we would be taught as one large group for several hours with frequent breaks to hold discussions. We would end up going through quite a number of classic works of literature and history, and it's unsurprising that we ended up reading Meditations by Marcus Aurelius, famed Stoic philosopher and emperor. It was at this time I became close friends with Bill, who was featured on an old video on this channel. We were enthralled with the process of coming into contact with all of these ancient philosophies and ways of being. Bill was the one to bring me into contact with Michael Sugru and his essential lecture on Aurelius. This is one of the many moments in my life I treasure the most. Our head on the chopping block, we surrender our life to the imperial cause, but a twist of fate catches us off guard. A dragon, though they had been thought to have died many centuries ago, attacked the very city which we had been brought to be executed. In the commotion, we get up and do our best to help however we can. We weave through the ruins of buildings and find ourselves working with Hadvar to stop the Stormcloaks from escaping Helgen, to reconvene with their allies and call for reinforcements. After working our way through the caves beneath Helgen, we find ourselves with a task ahead of us, to warn the Jarl of the impending threat of dragons that now faces Skyrim. We accompany Hadvar to his family home in the town of Riverwood. With some supplies, we head out of town but not before learning that some bandits had stolen a valuable artifact from the town merchant. Seeing as their location is not far off our path, we go to Bleak Falls Barrow to find the Golden Claw. We fight the bandits and face all sorts of adversity. We slay the dead that are rising to return them to the rest that is natural for all men. The Logos would have it no other way. Upon entering the final chamber, we come across a certain wall that teaches us a word and a language we don't quite recognize. We don't have much time to think before we are attacked by a particularly skilled undead Nord. We find ourselves in the possession of the Dragonstone after the fight, which seems oddly placed here. We return the claw and head to Whiterun to inform the Jarl of all we've found. The Jarl is grateful for our assistance, with both the information and the Dragonstone, but he finds that he needs one more thing, a dragon has come for Whiterun. We steal ourselves for the arduous fight ahead and face the dragon. After the prolonged struggle, our squad finds victory, and the unexpected happens. The dragon's soul is released, and we find a new source of power. Unexpectedly, fate and monks who speak a dead language have given us a clear purpose, to discover what it means to be dragonborn. As the MacGuffin shifts once more, we begin the long journey to the throat of the world. The year is 161 AD, and the young Marcus Aurelius has taken the throne of Rome. Adopted into the royal line, Aurelius has a different perspective than many of his predecessors. Aurelius saw that Rome had become weak from overindulgence, and he sought to be the watchman of Rome, protecting the empire while everyone else was asleep at the wheel. As an attempt to goad himself into a life of virtue in a world of corruption, Aurelius kept a journal. It was here he entreated himself to continue to follow the path of the Stoics before him. This work would later be publicly released after the death of the Emperor as Meditations. A brief note, some people, <coughs> Ryan Holiday, will try to make a big deal out of the fact that Aurelius wrote Meditations in Greek. This is a very odd point to make. Though Latin was the lingua franca of Rome at the time, Greek was spoken by at least half the empire, 
and anyone serious about philosophy would learn Greek to read the works in their original language. Due to the common usage of Greek in some of the most influential Greek texts, I find it unsurprising that Aurelius wrote in the same language. The real wonder of Meditations is not the language it was written in, but that it was written at all. As Aurelius is a public figure with a relatively clean record and a man with deep philosophical roots, it's incredible that we're able to be brought into the mind of this great man in history. However, what we find is not something that he probably wanted shared. In his writings, a bit of the Stoic mask falls and we see a vulnerable man who is desperate to remind himself to face the trials ahead with his head held high. He scolds himself for wanting to sleep in and reminds himself that he has all he needs and that comfort will soften his resolve. In the face of the widespread corruption he saw around him, he could not afford to falter. Among the many topics that Aurelius addressed in his writings, one was gratitude. Meditations opens with a moving series of passages where Aurelius recounts the impact that friends, family, and teachers had made on his character. He understood that everyone had a place in society, and just as Epictetus had lived his life as a slave without rebellion, Aurelius would need to do the same in his position. One can live well even in a palace. Marcus Aurelius he knew he had been given everything he needed to do the job in front of him well. He just needed to steady his resolve and perform under pressure. On this point, Aurelius wrote about control. It does not make sense to worry about anything, reasoned Aurelius, because if you can change something, then change it and you will no longer need to worry. However, if there's something that you cannot change, then why worry about it? You can do nothing but prepare for a proper reaction. This is a core aspect of the Stoic outlook, an unwavering strength in the path of adversity. And at the center of it all is virtue. The race the Stoic runs for is not for glory, but for something else. Good character, to live a good life, and to die a proper death. I seem to remember Seneca saying something along the lines of, If there is a reward for virtue after death, then so be it. However, if there is nothing, then it was still a life well lived. To the Stoic, their legend spoke of great men and women who fell into the trap of sensual pleasure, but always had the potential to become gods. Some Stoics latched onto this and developed an understanding that humanity was unlike any other beings. Gods, even Aristotle's unmoved mover, had characters that remained, for the most part, unchanged. However, humans are very much mutable. We can all be sinners, saints, and everything in between. If a man is given the choice to deny his desires for the good and pursue the Logos, would he not be the greatest of all there ever was? Why, this man would be greater than even Aristotle's God. I sunk deep into Skyrim and found a world full of possibilities. I led the Empire to victory in Skyrim. I single-handedly killed Mirak the Dragon Priest. I saved the world and defeated Alduin the World Eater. I was the Archmage of the College of Winterhold. I may have also been the leader of the Thieves' Guild and the Dark Brotherhood, where I may have also killed the Emperor Tamriel. As a fully contradictory, contradictory character, I conquered all that was before me, and it felt empty in the end. Skyrim didn't feel like it closed, and it was never over. The game was made so that even if you reached max stats with your character, you could just reset them and start again. It was like a hamster wheel and I had seen all I had cared to. I tried restarting the game a few times, but to no avail. I won't get into my grievances with the game here, but I don't feel like it offered a choice. Skyrim was a series of amusement park rides, and the real choice along the way was whether to get on or not. Mods did spice up the experience a bit, but I could never make it very far. I've watched Skyrim videos on YouTube for the last few years, hoping beyond hope that something would be able to bring me back. With the prospect of many other things I could be doing, this short playthrough felt like a brief goodbye. Goodbye to my childhood, goodbye to a game company that has let me down a few too many times. To be honest, I wanted this video to have more RP in it, but Skyrim and I have never been able to breathe life into my experience. We approach the monastery at the throat of the world and make our way into the interior to find our fate. We are initiated into the rites of the Dragonborn, and are asked to continue our initiation with the retrieval of more words of power. 
Destiny calls, and we continue to answer. Seeking to do what is only proper for us, we make our way through yet another Skyrim cave, and return to be fully initiated. Well, not before having to go through another godforsaken cave. For the moment, the path is set ahead for us. We will accomplish our duty as a son of the Empire, and protect the world from destruction as the chosen dragonborn. In the meantime, we join the companions and do our best to provide help wherever it's needed. Today's stoicism has seen a renewed interest due to numerous factors. Popularizers like Ryan Holiday played no small part. Stoics say you need to stop doing these five things. Along with the work of great professors like Michael Segru, who personally brought my imagination into the world of stoicism. Tomorrow isn't under your control. Do what's right today, so then let tomorrow take care of yourself. The stoic philosopher is the man who has liberated himself from fear. He's not afraid of death. He's not afraid of pain. He's not afraid of other people's dismissal as a fool. The only thing he cares about is that he should meet his moral obligations. Though he may not like the implications of the label, I'm not afraid to call Holiday an evangelist for the Stoic message. I admire his passion and his attempted resuscitation of an ancient tradition. And it's hard not to see the impact that the Stoic ethos has had on the internet landscape. It's hard not to imagine figures like David Goggins outside of the heritage that Stoicism provides. We're all being tested! And that road to success is a bumpy ass fucking road! It has fucking potholes, nails, detours, and shit! Yeah! A lot of you are gonna die with a nicely preserved body! No plates, no bad knees! No bruises, no scars! Stay hard! It's also not surprising to me that Goggin sounds like he's always reading out of meditations. I've heard that it's been a common practice for U.S. servicemen to be given Stoic texts to serve as an ethos to follow. Our modern formulation of Stoicism is easy to swallow. We have eliminated almost every mention of the supernatural in our discussions of the ancient philosophy, so that it may serve as a religion for those who have given up on or refuse religion outright. I've even heard of some people taking the lines of meditations out of context in order to justify why they think that Aurelius was a secret atheist or agnostic. The truth is that the concept of the Logos is incredibly important for understanding Stoicism, and while Stoicism doesn't directly imply theism, it seems nearly impossible to be an honest practitioner without being at the very least a pantheist. While this odd mix of secularism and Stoicism has been crippled and lacks a significant foundation, it is still spread like fire. There's such a desire for Stoicism that there are not enough people on YouTube creating content for it. Searches for things like meditations will bring up countless AI-generated videos to meet the demand. A word of warning, don't watch videos that are less than two hours and claim to be audiobooks of the meditations in modern language. These are all AI-converted translations of the text, with inhuman voiceovers. Content is lost in the process. In listening to one of these videos, there were sections that had their meanings completely changed. Stoicism of today has given us many gifts in practice and ethics, but lacks a foundational worldview to root it within. What do I make of all this? How do I sit with Stoicism now? I found a lot of wisdom in Stoicism, and I don't think that should be ignored. Wisdom is wisdom, regardless of where it comes from. Though I think there is a real struggle in taking on the practices of the Stoics without acknowledging the belief in the Logos and some of these more mystical foundations. There are some things that do bring me pause when considering Stoicism. However, I had a lot of trouble writing this section. Sometimes it feels like Stoicism is so loosely defined that one can easily claim that my understanding of Stoicism doesn't match theirs and therefore, my concerns are moot. So, I give a warning here. I'm painting with a broad brush, but I want everyone to know that my hesitations are out of love for Stoicism, and I want to address real patterns I've seen from practitioners long dead and those who are new converts. My first point is one of a lack of community and de-emphasis on others. I think the major reason that Stoicism does not look like a religion today is not because the Stoics lacked the belief that we attend to associate with the spiritual, but built into Stoicism 
there is a significant emphasis on self-reliance. To paraphrase Seneca, one Stoic perspective on friends is that we should not rely on friends for anything that they can give you. Friends are useful only in that they are someone else to provide for. While I do believe that wanting to provide something for others is a positive outlook, it misses one of the most important parts of all relationships, that they are relational. There is a consistent give and take. Friendship is reciprocal, and not in the way that many have heard this word. Friendship is not about taking note of who paid for lunch last. All members must fully contribute what they can without having to worry about such things. The same idea extends to communities. Communities are flawed, but they provide some of the greatest beauty that this world has to offer. This may be a personal difference that I find with Stoicism, but I firmly believe that the nature of the universe itself is communal. To sequester oneself away is to cut yourself off from the life-giving nature of the world itself. I think it would be right to also mention here that this is my concern with the suspicion around beauty and pleasure. To quote the teacher from Ecclesiastes, there is a time for all things under the sun. And from my humble perspective, I don't see Stoicism reflecting this wisdom. This tendency to take the best of one side of the equation and disregard the other is a theme throughout my critique. Some will point out that some Stoics, like Epictetus, chose to have some semblance of a family structure in their personal lives, but I would argue that this is an exception to the rule that proves it. These cases seem to point out to me that Stoic dogma is somewhat incomplete and struggles to account for this variation. My next thought is on the role of strength and the seeming lack of room for feminine representation. While there are some women who consider themselves Stoics, such as Camilla Cabello, it's hard not to recognize a significant gap in representation between men and women in the Stoic space. Carrying my point on from before, I think that the Stoics do an amazing job in pointing to the best of what we define as masculinity and what it has to offer. For example, strength to push through hard times and direct leadership. Masculinity well utilized serves as a pillar for others to rely on. However, I find that things that we tend to associate with femininity are either ignored or outright rejected by Stoicism. To me, one example of this is the rejection of all emotions in Stoicism as distraction, with that the belittling of community. The strengths that I find in the feminine are emotional maturity and acting as a communal glue holding groups together. Where the Stoics reject compassion as a force that brings feebleness and emotions as an unsettling force, the feminine answer to these two is a healthy processing of these feelings for a time and to not let them grow into something else by being pushed down. I already harped on community a bit, but the battle between egos is often considered masculine. The feminine side of this would be a spirit of welcoming and collaboration. While this last point is not entirely applicable to Stoicism, it's an easy place to fall into in these topics around Stoicism. I briefly want to return to compassion. Compassion is very underrepresented in Stoic thought, as I previously mentioned. Some say that this rejection of compassion on the part of the Stoics is due to the historical environment that it was founded in, that if one was to give time and attention to their emotions, they would quickly find themselves dead from the difficult atmosphere of the times. With this logic, some modern Stoics would say that compassion is now a virtue because there is space and resources for it. However, I don't buy this. Both that today is some entirely different environment and that it was an adaptive solution to a current problem. I mean, for goodness sakes, Zeno of Sidium, the father of Stoicism, identified negative emotions as the source of humanity's struggles and their presence as a weak spot of reason in the mind of humanity. The idea of working someone through grief is not in the cards for a Stoic. To take on compassion as a virtue is to depart from the Stoic project and start something new. My last reservation is concerning a focus on what I'm going to call the inner light. This response was originally stated by G.K. Chesterton, but I'll do my best to present it as well as I can. Stoicism seems to hold the individual self to the highest regard. If one is to look for strength, it must be to the logos working within oneself. However, I see this as mistaken. As I have implied earlier, 
I think there is a tendency to idolize oneself in the Stoic tradition, to focus on becoming a god and rejecting all else, while the principle is focused on the logos within, what seems to end up happening is that the practitioners of Stoicism end up worshipping themselves. This leads to navel-gazing beyond one's imagination. If the Logos is external, this would address this problem. However, to the Stoic, the strength needed to face all problems is within. Any other issue is a mental block or irrational problem. When we look within for a solution, we run into a problem that is unavoidable. We are all biased and see ourselves in a way that is inaccurate. Just like some will look into a mirror and think they are vastly overweight when they are perfectly healthy, we can do the same when analyzing our own character. This is another major reason why community is important. We surround ourselves with people who we can trust and use their input as a secondary metric on our own self-perception. Both the interior perspective of the self and the exterior one is vitally important. While I hold all of these serious reservations, I also find that there is a way I can take things from Stoicism and place them into my own context. Though my conception of the Logos is a bit different from the Stoics, I find that it is an essential idea that grounds my worldview. The practices of the Stoics are also a great help in addressing anxiety and fear. However, they work even better in a community. And in that spirit, I call you all to do the same. Find structure in whatever community is available to you and be someone willing to both give and receive in this collection of people. I wanted to dedicate this video to a few people. Uh, first and foremost, to my amazing, patient, and hot wife. Thank you so much for everything you did um, in supporting me in making this, and uh, helping me along the way with little things, and just uh, being a person who is willing to listen to me ramble about stoicism for the last month or so. So. Thank you so much. I wanted to also dedicate this to the late Michael Segru. He had just passed away when I was working on this. And uh, I mean, even the I haven't even watched a lot of his stuff, but even the little bit of impact he had on me uh, was incredible. So uh, you should check out his videos, um, honor his legacy. Please, please go and do that. I also wanted to dedicate this to... Um, the subscribers of mine who have been waiting on a video like this for a little bit. Uh, I know I've been kind of teasing a bigger project and uh, it's kind of finally here. I hope you enjoyed it and uh, there's more coming. Just uh, I'm, I'm still, still kind of thinking about what's next. And uh, last but not least, I want to dedicate this to new and old friends and friends to come. Um, thank you for uh, being a community around me and um, for your role and just uh, my personal development. Um, you've, you've done a lot for me, and I hope I provide something, at least uh, a fraction of what you uh, do for me back to you. So, thank you. Uh, to everyone else um, who is who's watching, um, please leave a comment. Uh, subscribe if you're interested for more. Uh, you might want to check out other videos to see if you're, you'll be interested, but um, yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear anything in the comments. So um, please let me know your thoughts and uh, I'll see you all later. Have a good one.